but also what are the strategic consequences for Norway and Europe uh, concerning Sweden and Finland's prospective NATO memberships. We will then move on to discuss the relationship between security and the global economy. How is economic warfare developing in our time? How are foreign investments relevant for security policy? And how can Norway pursue its interests in this situation? And finally, we will consider uh, the consequences of the war in Ukraine with regards to energy, climate, and the green transition that has been sped up by the Ukraine, uh, European decoupling from Russian energy sources. Now, also in this session, you may submit your questions. Use the app, and I, will, I have an iPad, and I will do my best to include you guys um, in the Q&A later. Then the first part of this session, as you may hear, will be in English, and then we will do some, there will be 10 people on the stage in the next hour. So we will uh, switch it up a little bit, and then we'll also switch to Norwegian as soon as um, the panel is all Norwegian. Now, for this first part, uh, we have a range of great speakers. Jule Wilhelmsen is research professor at NUPI and a well-known in the Norwegian foreign policy discussion through her research and commentary on Russian foreign and security policy. Karin Anna Eggen is a PhD fellow at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies, where she's writing a doctoral dissertation on Russian information confrontation and information operations in the Nordic region. Flemming Splitsbol Hansen is senior research at, uh, fellow at the Danish Institute for International Studies, where he works on domestic and foreign policy in the post-Soviet space. These will join the discussion soon, but first we will get some opening remarks from Kadri Leek. Kadri is a prominent journalist and policy analyst and an expert on Russia, Eastern Europe and the Baltic region at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Kadri, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Nupi, for inviting me. My, my pleasure to be here. Always nice to come to Oslo. Um, however, my task is say something that makes sense about Russia, and that is a tall order, because even though I have spent all my working life focusing on Russia-related matters, I cannot say I understand everything that is happening in Russia today. And to start with, I do not understand properly this war. My first thesis would be that this war was not inevitable. It was not inevitable because Russia is somehow inherently imperialistic, as some people claim, or that authoritarian regimes always inevitably end up at attacking other, other countries. I don't think that is a universal rule. I don't think that path was predestined for Russia. Uh, Russian political elite in their policy discussions in late 2021, none of them thought that a major war with Ukraine is a desirable thing or inevitable thing. And it wasn't inevitable also because, as Putin claims, NATO created the conditions for it, that the West encircled Russia and left Russia with no choice. That is not the case either. And I'm not going, for time reasons or others, back into the history of Russia-West relations, but just one thing might be useful to point out here. I think in the years before the war, Biden presidency was actually engaging with Russia in a different way they were talking in different terms. And many of the grievances that Russia allegedly had about the West could have been addressed between Putin and Biden. We could see Biden offered to discuss security, offered to discuss arms control. I think even status of Ukraine was somehow on the table and could have been addressed. But Putin chose war. To me, this war is Putin's war of choice. And I don't understand why, why he chose it. It's clearly placed on flawed analysis of Ukraine and the world, but it's also out of character when it comes to him, because he has risked everything. And that is not something he has done previously. Putin has been a risk taker, but these have been calculated risks. And there has been way back available to him. And I don't see that any longer this time. Now, when I say that this is Putin's war of choice, 
This does not mean that others in Russia are necessarily against it, or even if they are, that they can do something to stop it. I don't think anyone but Putin has a right to say anything. They, lack, they simply lack vote. Most Russian public, I think they overwhelmingly support the war. Okay, they support the war that they see on TV, and that is not the war that we see on our TV. Um, but even so, there is support. Uh, Putin is increasingly selling the conflict as one between Russia and the West, and that makes it palatable, both to the general public, but also to experts and elites. It is better to think of your country as having stood up against America as having invaded a smaller neighbor. And I can see how also the foreign policy elites, they were horrified by the war when it started. Now they are increasingly rallying to the flag. And there seems to be an impression among the elites that it might have been stupid to start the war, but now that it has been started, we need to press on. There is no way back. In these conditions, I do not think that we can talk about peace or compromise anytime soon. I think it will take a long while before it's fought out on the battlefield in whose terms any negotiations are going to take place. Right now, we are still not there. Both Russia and Ukraine hope to have the upper hand that would allow them to dictate terms, even if not fully, even if with some sacrifices, compromises, what, what not. I do not think the West can mediate any Western country, no Turkey, China. They might have certain things they could do to dictate terms to Russia, but they don't want to. Uh, I, I think China has, first and foremost, China's interests in mind. And it's also unclear to me what Putin calls victory. I mean, in territorial terms, we don't know, you know, how far does he want to go when it is enough for him, and he doesn't make it clear, or, or how it can be won, even if he controlled Ukraine. I mean, that will be a devastated territory with rebellious population, and Russia would need to handle it being under Western sanctions, because West will not forgive and forget, is, is that a victory? I mean, Russia will have lost much of its economy, many of its trade links, political connections, its overall room for manoeuvre. It will have a worse position internationally than the one it had before. What Putin seems to be hoping for, and it comes across in many of his speeches, that Western hegemony will fall. He increasingly speaks about world majority and world majority being fed up with Western hegemony. And he could think that if the West as a whole becomes less important, then actually he might keep the spoils of the war, whatever they end up being, and, and restore Russia's international status to the level it was before the war. And I think here is something we should think about hard, the so-called, yes, world majority or, or global south. I think we should up our game when it comes to our contacts with, with these countries and do it not just rhetorically, not just, you know, it's not a propaganda effort. It's not that you go and, and tell them that you need to support Ukraine, you need to support us. I think we really need to recalibrate our view of the world. These countries don't want to be framed again in the bipolar world and choose Russia or the West. They see themselves as independent players that have matured and that have their own agenda. And this is their prism at how they look at the things. And we better adapt to it. And I think it would also be good for us to understand when we talk about restoration of rule-based world order, and many of us talk about it, and many of us lazily assume that this means you know, return of the 1990s or return of sort of Western hegemony, heyday of American power. I don't think that will happen. 
world will change anyway, or it's, and it's an inevitable process, given how in demographic and economic terms the other countries are raising and catching up with the West. And we better prepare ourselves for that. And I think, paradoxically, there might even be reason to be thankful for Russia, because I think if we get it right, the war will actually hasten, uh, speed up our ability to adapt. So what can we do where we are? I think four things I can think of. First, keep our own societies healthy. Try to keep political debate civilized and, and sane. I can see lots of polarization and maximalism in many countries. And while it is completely understandable, I don't think it is healthy. There are many reasons to be angry with Russia, but anger is never a good guide for policymaking, nor, nor does it make anyone attractive. I think we should support Ukraine as we can, because how can we not to? I mean, they really are undisputed victim in that war. At the same time, watch out and try to be careful about escalation, because there are ways where risk could escalate far beyond where we are now. We should recalibrate our approach to the rest of the world, as I, as I described. And that is really hard for policymakers in democratic countries facing that maximalist pressure from domestic audiences. And finally, I think we should try to articulate some message all should do Russians. We need to be realistic, of course, about how that can be achieved. I mean, it cannot go very far. We won't be let into Russian information space. It doesn't reach wide audiences. Nor can it be very detailed, because we don't know what kind of Russia will emerge from this war. But I think it would be useful if someone high level in the West said that we do see us having a future relationship with Russia. We don't make Russia's disintegration uh, and total collapse our, our goal. And while this war might indeed be existential for Putin, because I think he has intertwined his political fate with the war in ways that cannot be rolled back. It needs not to be existential for Russia. And I think it's good if we made that clear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kadri, for your introductory remarks. I thought that was very interesting. And uh, uh, where you ended uh, sort of resonated well with, I think, some of the things that the prime minister said uh, as well about um, Russia. And Putin's Russia, and you also said this is Putin's war. So I wanted to delve a little bit more um, about on Russia before we sort of uh, widen the funnel here a little bit. And uh, I wanted also the Prime Minister Yulia talked about uh, understanding, which was a very contentious issue last year in Norwegian debate. Uh, maybe it was semiotic, uh, but there was a debate about understanding and explaining and, uh, and um, condemning. Uh, not in English, that would be easier to distinguish. Uh, but what, Yulia, why is it, when it comes to Russia today, it seems paradoxical that we need to understand Russia. But what, how would you say, what would, how would you approach the, approach the question, why do we need to understand Russia that's waging this gruesome war? Hmm. I think first reason would be pretty obvious. As Ulf said, uh, most people in Europe today understand Russia as the enemy. And to understand your enemy is crucial. Um, and then I think uh, there is still a need to stress that Russia changes. So the Putin regime before and after COVID, for example, are two different things. So we need to keep following, <laughs> trying to learn uh, uh, what the Putin regime is about. And uh, since the war started, uh, we are also in a kind of fog of war, where it's very easy to... Um, project these black and white images, which are useful for strategic, uh, in strategic use, and which are somehow comfortable <laughs> because it makes, it, it places guilt very clearly on one side, and there's nothing we can do about it. But I don't think it's uh, <coughs> useful for building good policies. So I think it's crucial to keep asking and uh, looking uh, to get a truthful picture of what Putin's uh, Russia is. And I'm also afraid of, even if 
the, uh, the guilt for this aggressive and terrible war on Ukraine is all on Russia's side. I think the notion that there is nothing which could have been done on the West side, Western side, um, now or before that could have made a difference. I think that is not useful because also Western politicians need to think that they have a room for maneuver in their policies. So that is a core argument for, um, for understanding what's going on on the, on the Russian side. And my final point will be in line with, with Kadri's that um, if we are to see a different and, and better Russia, I think the change will have to come from within. Uh, therefore, we will have to keep looking at what's going on within Russia. And if Western uh, policies in any way is going to have an effect on internally in Russia, today it feels like nothing we do actually matters so much. But it probably will and could. So um, the question of, you know, time will come <laughs> and it will be important to win hearts and minds possibly support good new developments in, in Russia. Therefore, we need to keep um, understanding, following what's going on. Fleming, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I very much agree, uh, especially on, on this latter point, but it seems premature, of course, to talk about a time when things will change and we need to get ready for it. But Russia is changing. Uh, Russian, Russia is becoming radicalized uh, almost by the day. And so we have to face a different Russia. We have, to, we have to prepare for that. And the image that I often use is that the regime used to be over here, relatively stable, but now it has moved to a different place and it's becoming radicalized. And in this process, Putin also uses radicalization to keep away critics and so on. But it will emerge in a different place and it will be a different Russia and we need to prepare for that. The Russians, of course, um, have also, they identify themselves in a different way and has been described, of course, this very problematic relationship uh, that they had uh, with the West. And few people have described this better, than, of course, than your own, uh, Ivan Neumann. But we see this now also in this, this discussion about could we have done something wrong? And I agree, we, we, we need to look at ourselves and we need to discuss whether we should have done something differently. One of the things that we need to remain open to, of course, is the fact that maybe we admitted Russia prematurely, uh, that we should have asked more from Russia back in the 90s. So rather than to include Russia in the club, perhaps we should have been more strict uh, when it comes to certain standards. So we talked about uh, sort of uh, status confusion that Russia believed that it was a superpower, at least a great power, and we decided in a way to treat it as such, even if there were lots of problems at home that could have been changed. Uh, but of course, we need to understand Russia to understand how to proceed from here. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's very challenging as it is right now. Mm -hmm. Carla? Yeah, no, I, I just want to add to what already has been said, and I think both uh, Julia and Fleming has excellent points, and Kadri as well. Um, so I, I do probably agree um, what you said, Fleming, about, um, and it ties into the discussion about like what could the West have done or what could Russia have done, you know, in order to prevent being at this stage and this time uh, of uh, insecurity uh, as we are today. And I think probably I'm leaning more towards the probably should have demanded more from uh, Russia earlier on and um, we also saw leading up to uh, February 24th there, the, the Western uh, diplomats, Western leaders were uh, trying to use the room for maneuver, trying to engage with Russia, you know, using all the diplomatic efforts we had available to try and find a solution. Maybe we can talk about uh, nuclear deterrence options uh, um, uh, etc. And, and this was consequently denied by Russia. Uh, instead, they decided to demand that we actually want a different European security architecture. That's, and that's the only thing we will agree on. If not, we're going to take it as an aggressive act from the West. Um, so in, in that regard, I think it's important also to, yes, we should understand Russia. We should look at what they say. We should look at what they do. And and uh, when you combine them, at least what I see is a Russia that has for a long time 
prior to COVID, prior to February 24th, prior to 2014 as well, um, said openly that they want a different world order. They want a different European secur security architecture, and they want to change many of the values and, that we uh, uh, believe in, to use uh, that frame. So just... Mm -hmm. Yes, but then, then they have also sort of failed in that because uh, so uh, we need to understand Russia to see also change in Russia to you know deal with a future Russia and a, an, an alternative Russia to the Russia that we have today. But this war has also made Europe change, mm -hmm. right? And uh, in the first session as well, um, the Swedish and Finnish NATO membership applications was mentioned. This changes Europe and it ch changes the Nordics and it changes sort of the the scope for Norwegian foreign policy. So in that sense, uh, Karl, uh, Russia really have failed in their strategic uh, plans not to have Europe integrate further. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, so in my research as well, um, what I've been looking at is how Russia has tried to change uh, Nordic, the various Nordic countries' security policies, especially targeting the deterrence and reassurance element that is uh, inherent in all countries' security policies. Uh, and they spent quite a lot of effort on trying to do this. Um, but February 24th and Finland and Sweden's decision to apply for NATO membership is probably the most uh, clear uh, example of Russia failing to reach its strategic objectives in the Nordic region. Um, that said, though, um, the situation we are in now uh, leads to less dialogue uh, the uh, relationship between Russia and the Nordic countries and Europe and the West uh, is at its lowest point um, in decades and decades. And um, what this means, like, when we don't have... Uh, that also means that Russia has less access to information in a time where the Nordic region becomes strategically more important for Russia because it will now be a NATO hub because of Norway's energy position or a position as an energy provider... Um, and the need and interest for more information about security policy decisions, about technology, technological know-how will be even more uh, important, will probably lead to more aggressive and covert uh, attempts, um, uh, intelligence gathering, uh, in order to get that information. And Russia will also use uh, the, um, the considerable amount of uh, time and energy they've used on planting certain perceptions and um, and um, and also disinformation in our societies. They, and they've done so extensively in peacetime. And they can really try to hammer on and focus on on sort of spreading uh, com so um, so confusion, split unity, uh, using the information they've spent many years collecting during peacetime. When we have thought, well, we're at peace with Russia, so. Uh, they shouldn't have any malign intent. Did you want to add something, Julia? No, I just wanted to kind of uh, pinpoint that this misunderstanding in Norwegian, so to understand Russia, maybe we should rather put in the sentence to, to have knowledge about Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and that also is crucial during this, this war, to take it back to the war. This morning I read how, um, how uh, Russia is forcefully uh, uh, recruiting people uh, to the war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and they are su succeeding in, in the way that Russia will mobilize many, many <laughs> more troops to throw into uh, the terrible meat grinder, grinder which this war is, is becoming. And that's, that's, that's knowledge about Russia. And this, that type of knowledge is very necessary uh, uh, to have it, it come out not in, uh, in this kind of information war way that we need to support Ukraine. Thus, we will not say that actually Russia might probably be able to be even stronger than Ukraine, even with the military support from the Western side. So it's, it's not just to make clear that it's, it's knowledge we need. And knowledge is not necessarily... That's not having sympathy for Russia, uh, bringing out what's actually going on. It's creating a realistic picture, uh, which is necessary for us to also support Ukraine in this war. Father, you're nodding forcefully. Uh, it looks like you want to add something to this. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more with Julie. I, 
I also find it that discussing Russia is often very difficult because in many audiences, when you explain Russia, it is understood as you are justifying somehow that behavior, which is not so for professional researchers. And I yeah, I appreciate the idea to talk about knowledge of Russia, especially as understanding Russia in Germany, where I am based, that has a specific connotation. But I, um, talking of Russia-West relations, I mean, my own view is that things might have gone wrong very early on when Russia wanted to become, signed up for sort of Western system, wanted to become a full-fledged member and then failed to live up to their rules and norms internally. And that meant that in a European system that privileged democracy, Russia was bound to be a substandard member. And that is no one's fault, actually, because, you know, people who, from Soviet side, actually, then, who were party to drafting Paris Charter and who signed it, they, they were not misled or they were, you know, they knew what they were doing and, and they were perfectly fine with it. And I think West wanted to bring Russia into. So that was done with best of intentions by everyone. But I agree very much with what you said, that this meant actually that Russia failed to articulate also clearly how they saw European security system, but that this was their problem. And Putin is not always a good communicator anyway. You know, sometimes he uses sort of hypocrit hypocrisy to get his points across. Sometimes he speaks plain truth, but we are so grotesque that we don't take it seriously, like his statement that Ukraine is not even a country. I mean, what do you do with that? So... Um, but my point, why, or I think my point is that we should discuss what went wrong, where, what we could have done differently. But this is not, we shouldn't make ourselves responsible. I mean, nothing that we did wrong, and there were many things. Nothing excuses or even explains Russia bombing Ukrainian cities and civilians. That's... And I think we should avoid that impression. Yeah, thank you. I just want to make a point, maybe too, about, about the interest. And, and you talked about the Baltic Sea and the Nordic region and so on, at least from, from a Danish perspective. And I speak, of course, only on in my own behalf. But we're very much now getting ready for a Baltic Sea region with the inclusion of, of uh, Finland and Sweden into NATO, where we'll see more tension. It will be a more dense area. Uh, and we see this already. <clears throat> the Russians are building up in the Kaliningrad uh, area, the small part of Russia that is squeezed in between Poland and Lithuania. We expect more of that. So there will be more tension. <clears throat> and then my expectation will be, as part of this, that it's, everything is squeezed in to the Baltic Sea. It's very difficult for the Russians to move. They will move their capabilities into uh, the Arctic region. That will have consequences for Norway, of course. It will also, for the Kingdom of Denmark, because of Greenland and because of the Faroe Islands in the North Atlantic, and we are getting ready for that also. So there may be something to look at to see how the spillover, possible spillover, will be even stronger. And then perhaps just an, a different point that I was thinking about when I traveled to Oslo that I would like to make. And your Prime Minister spoke about interest and how, what are Norwegian interests in this and how can you influence and where can you influence and so on. And we had a similar discussion. And when I look at what is happening in Ukraine, and I think you should know that increasingly within our group, within our community, we speak about the war as the dismantling of the last empire in Europe, the Russian Empire. The Russian Empire that never really collapsed. It's now collapsing. And that also serves to explain why the Russians, why Putin and the regime are engaging so heavily in this, why they're ready to go so far. And so what I say at home, at least, when I, I meet people and I go out for public lectures and they ask about interests, what are Danish interests in this? I increasingly say, look, take a strategic focus. Think about what happened in 1989 with, the, with Central Europe, Central Europe, like, for instance, Estonia, was cut free in 91. But in, 90, in, in 89, 1991, Central Europe was cut free from the Soviet Union. And now, finally, there's a chance that Eastern Europe will be cut free from Russia. And this is our strategic focus. And we all, of course, have an interest in a stable and more prosperous Europe. And this is also part of it. But 
when you look at it as the dismantling of the last empire in Europe, it also tells you that this may be, it may drag on, it may be difficult, it may be uh, complicated, it'll be dirty, it'll be difficult, but this is perhaps the strategic focus that we have. And, and of course, there's a clear Norwegian interest in this also. I think you're right, even though I, I think I understand also why uh, uh, invoking empire as a category of analysis comes easier to Danes than Norwegians. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we understand. Yeah. <laughs> But I think, uh, Karnana, this is, I think, you know, let's use, let's use uh, Stöd as uh, an analytic framework here, right? Uh, what, what are our interests and where can we make a difference? And, and to go back to the, to, to the expansion of NATO, to the changing Nordic region, two countries uh, joining NATO. We used to be the eyes and ears of NATO in the north. This will change. Uh, how well is Norway coping with that? So let's, you know... Um, or how should Norway cope with that? And is that, a, is that a challenge for Norway to actually deal with having uh, two Nordic countries join NATO? So that's interesting, you know, the whole the notion of Norway being NATO's eyes and ears. Because if you ask the prime minister, and he said it today too, and if you ask the chief of defense, they're gonna, they are uh, saying that, no, but we're still going to be NATO's eyes and ears. It doesn't change if... Uh, Finland and Sweden uh, joins uh, NATO. So, uh, and I've tried to challenge uh, the chief of defense on this question as well, because uh, at least the way I see it, when uh, Finland and Sweden uh, joins NATO, you close the strategic gap. You have this uh, collected uh, NATO, Nor Nordic NATO hub, um, and uh, which I think it's a good thing. I think it will increase uh, Nordic security, and it will, uh, it's a clear signal to Russia, uh, it will increase our deterrence capability, so I, and of course, um, and that's good, right? We, we like that, um, especially now when and we have entered an era of, you know, strategic competition, more uncertainty, etc. Um, but of course, it will change Norway's role. I, I think it will, uh, and we need to have a discussion on that. For example, uh, even Neumann and Jonas Karstöre both pointed to uh, two really important concepts, deterrence and reassurance. Um, and they spoke about how, and uh, Neumann pointed to how, uh, you know, the U.S. might push the balancing act that we hold very dear in Norway. Uh, uh, but I think probably what's going to change that uh, balance might be what Finland and Sweden chooses to do. Uh, if Finland says, well, we're not going to have any self-imposed restrictions, we're going to have exercises how far north we want. What do we then do in Norway? Because then it doesn't make sense for us to have those restrictions. So, and, but then again, they are self-imposed restrictions. It's a unilateral decision. So we can change that if we want to, but it's a deep-founded part of Norwegian identity, and I think that's going to be probably one of the key decisions that, or discussions that we will have to have going forward. I'd like to have one final question for this panel for Julia. Mm -hmm. So, and also reflecting on our own uh, session here, if, if uh, the war in Ukraine has, and if so, how has it changed the very meaning of the concept of security? what does security mean? It, there is a sense that it's being narrowed, right, by the war. Is that a long-term thing, or is it an immediate response? What are your thoughts about that? Uh, I think it's um, a long-term thing. Uh, and actually, it's quite a frightening <laughs> long-term thing. Because if you look at other concepts of creating security, so the concept of security is created through cooperation, for example, I think we could say it's near dead. <laughs> and then the concept which you're talking about, Karanana, uh, which is the mix of deterrence and reassurance, in this case of formerly the Soviet Union, now uh, Russia. I think that uh, uh, policy is coming on, under strain. And I listened to the chiefs of defense of Finland, Sweden and Norway in Kirkenes a couple of ways, uh, weeks ago. And that's the one thing I noticed, that the Finnish approach is not the Norwegian approach. It's deterrence. It's not about deterring and reassuring. So uh, taking a bird's eye view of this, I think it's um, 
uh, is for sure in Russia. There's one way to create security. It's the threat of use of force, it's the buildup of use of force now, and it's the use of force. But also on the Western side, uh, there is a tendency to think that building up military might uh, will, is the solution <laughs> to more things than it should be the solution to. So it's about uh, punishing and deterring Russia. It can easily be about punishing and deterring China. And then you might ask yourself, what comes at the end of that? If you have all parties uh, embracing this logic, will we get more security for all? or will we get more war than we have uh, already? So I think that's a kind of fear I have, that in the foreign policy toolbox, um, the military security tool has become very, very dominant. So um, what happens? How, you know, where's the place for diplomacy here? Where is the place for other types of interests? Where is the place for compromise and negotiation? I think that's that, I think, is, is, uh, was already there before this war started, but it's accelerated, and it goes quickly, and we need to watch, watch it. <laughs> yeah. And it is also a call for thinking systematically about Norwegian foreign policy and how Norway should respond, which is what we're doing here. So uh, thank you very much all for your, for your uh, interventions. We will now do a very uh, Skavlan-ish uh, mm. reshuffle and thank this panel uh, and, and have a new panel come up, but please uh, give them a round of applause. <laughs>